is for me it's a very um well nostalgic because I love the movie but I also was forced to read the Iliad and the Odyssey in high school um which turned out being to be quite the blessing and roughly just so you know the Odyssey is the epilogue, the ending. Um, apparently there were actually many, many, many more myths, but in this, um, panoply of ancient, far ancient Greek mythology. So, the Odyssey was, uh, the journey home for Odysseus, the long, ten-year, arduous arduous journey home after he had helped Hector and Achilles no oh, sorry Achilles and Agamemnon and Menelaus from Greece defeat the great Hector and his oh um, cowardly younger brother Paris at least that's how it was portrayed in the movies I forget how he, whether he was a, a warrior, but he stole Helen of Troy, nonetheless. Uh, Helen of Greece, originally. And that's what sparked the war. So, hope you enjoy it. And um, here's part one. Wisdom Zeus is Zeus's daughter, Zeus, the god of gods. And we have Poseidon, the god of the sea. Zeus, Zeus's brother. And we have Aeolus, Aeolus god of the winds. And we have 
Hermes, Hermes, the messenger of the gods, Hyperion, the sun god. Then we have Circe, the goddess of enchantment, Calypso, the goddess of silence, and lastly Polyphemus, the Cyclops. son of Poseidon. And for any of you basic lit buffs out there, I guess apparently the Cyclops is a very phallic representation of, oh wow, we got rain. Real rain, guys. Odysseus, our protagonist, the main guy, son of Laertes, king of Ithaca, his wife Penelope, his son Telemachus, and then Menelaus, the instigator, former husband of Helen, instigator of the entire Trojan War. Yes, the thunder once again indicates wow there's been a lot of serendipitous timings with uh, thunder tonight and of course we have Helen the theme around which the uh, scapegoat if you will for uh, giving men giving men allows an Agamemnon a reason to go try to sack, and successfully doing so, sacking Troy. And then we have Agamemnon, Menelaus's older, more powerful brother, I believe. The uh, leader of the Greeks. And then we have Nausicaa, daughter of King Alcinus. Alcinus, king of the Phaeacians and Eumaeus, the swineherd, loyal to Odysseus. Chapter One The Lotus Eaters. The city of Troy was in flames. Odysseus looked back and laughed. For ten bitter years, the Greek army had laid siege to the city. Now at last, they had done what they came to do. The walls of Troy, built by God beside him, Poseidon himself, were tumbled to the ground. And Poseidon was Poseidon himself. Paris, prince of Troy, who had dared to steal away the beautiful Helen from King Menelaus, dead. Now Odysseus and his comrades could go home. It was not much, perhaps, Odysseus' own Ithaca, a poor, bare, low-lying island far out to the west. The island of the setting sun, and there it is right there, nearly the furthest west in all of Greece. But every man loves the land where he is born, and no place on earth was dearer to, to Odysseus than Ithaca. For all those years that the Greeks had warred against Troy, his heart had been yearning for his own. Ithaca 
may be thin and starved, but it grows true sons. Odysseus had left one behind. Telemachus, Telemachus. He often thought of his son and his wife Penelope and longed to be with them. In truth, he had never wanted to leave them. What did he care if Paris had taken the fancy, taken a fancy to Menelaus's wife, Helen, when Agamemnon, Menelaus's brother, who led the Greek army against Troy, came to collect Odysseus to join the expedition? He pretended to be mad. He yoked a horse and a bull together to plow the seashore and sow it with salt. But they pushed his son Telemachus into his path. Odysseus swerved to avoid him, and they saw through the act. Odysseus, you shall plan for us, said King Agamemnon, for your cunning may indeed win where strength fails. Cunning indeed was needed where strength and bravery of two sides were so finely balanced. It was Odysseus who came up with the plan to deceive the Trojans into opening their city gates, so letting the finest Greek soldiers into the city concealed inside a wooden horse. Then Troy. Of all the leaders of Greeks, Odysseus was the most eager to be on his way. He called his men, and they sat, and they set sail while the sky behind them still burned red. Not with the sunset, but in fact with the fire, as you can see, the great fires of the sacking and raising and pillaging and plundering destruction of Troy. But bad luck was with them from the start. Great Zeus, who wields the thunder and lightning, sent such storms that their ships bucked and plunged in the waves like frightened horses. The rain scoured all color from the world until they could not tell sea from sky. The wind tore their sails to shreds. There was nothing they could do but pull for shore. And there they lay, weary and sick at heart, for two days and nights, while the storm blew itself out. On the third day, they set sail once more, only to be dragged, caught by the fierce currents that pulled them far, far off course. Dragged south by the relentless wind in waves for ten whole days, until at last they reached land. They went ashore and soon found fresh water. Odysseus sent a party of men inland to find out who lived in this hot, far-off country. None of them returned. None of his men returned. At last Odysseus himself went in search of them. In a clearing he found one of his men. He was laying on his back, humming a tune. Odysseus recognized the melody. It was an old Ithacan lullaby, such as every mother croons to her baby. The man hardly seemed to recognize Odysseus. Instead, he held out some fruit, saying, Here, have some. 
His voice was slurred, and juice from the ripe fruit was dribbling down his chin. Odysseus slapped his cheek to bring him back around. Little by little, the story came out. This was the land of the lotus eaters, so called because their only food was the honeyed lotus fruit. They had offered their fruit to Odysseus's men. Whoever tasted it once lived only to taste it again. Lived only to taste it again. Odysseus tried to reason with the man, don't you want to go home? I'm already home, the man mumbled. I'm already home. With his mouth full of fruit, he began to slip once more into his waking dream, and nothing Odysseus did or said could stir him from it. Odysseus returned to the ships and fetched more men, cautioning them not to eat the lotus fruit. Do not eat the lotus fruit. They dragged their blank-eyed, smiling companions back to the ship, one by one. By one. By one. Tied them up and fled from that deadly land where the lotus fruit traps men in a trance of childhood. As the oars dipped once more into the whitening sea, they tried to shut their ears from the piet piteous cries of those men who had eaten. so much.